Book group with Mary. Through the Mists by Robert James Lees. This is session one of chapter 11. 20th of September 2012, Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia. Hello everyone, how are you doing? Hello. About um, how when people hear some divine truth and start to connect to maybe pain in their past, that unless we're truly humble and we really want to grow sincerely, it can become a very unloving environment to be in because everyone becomes self-involved and they only want to talk about, hi Alexis, how are you? Well, I've been feeling this. And it's not actually a sincere or genuine getting to connect with a person. That's what I feel. I feel... Um, that a and I, and when I sense that the emotions are still there, you know, like well, there's only shit that's gonna come out of it because you know it's just because the emotions are still there is the feeling. You know? Yeah, but I don't believe that's true either. Yeah. I believe we can all make the choice to be really humble in our interactions with each other. Yeah. And in doing that, we will we will honor ourselves as well as the other person. Sometimes I feel like people lose sight of both those things. They get <coughs> self-involved and caught up and it feels scary and we because we don't want to honor truth we want to honor fear we can get very closed off from everyone else yeah. and then we end up having interactions that are based around our fears and or, or around wanting to placate our fears like we all belong so we just talk about these things that make us feel a little bit calmer about the truth we've heard instead of just being really real with each other you know yeah. that's love is very real and connected with each other and if we want to love which I think we all do. <laughs> <laughs> say we do. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's also a phase that a lot of us pass through, hey, when we, when we open up to all this pain and we go, actually, I don't know if I want to love. This hurts too much. And, and unless we're humble to that process, we can get really stuck there. Yeah. yeah. Being yeah. sort of victim to the pain. Yeah. 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 And a lot of this was brought on by the thing that AJ mentioned in the last chapter about how if we just intellectually go there, we're just going to be in the hells. Yes. Because yes. This, the emotions are just not really... Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Let's stop. <laughs> yeah, we should start now. We should start now. Yeah, yeah, we'll are we all go? Everybody can just do it. Yes. Well. So today we're not using microphones, which is great, I think. It means we can have a good flow, but it just means being conscious of speaking up so that you, your voice gets on the recording. We've got these powerful mics on the videos that pick up things pretty well, but if you speak really softly and everyone else is speaking loud, when Igor adjusts the sound, you'll get really soft in the, in the recording. So just out of care for everyone else who wants to uh, participate long distance. Now, does everyone know we're up to chapter 11? Yes, yes that's good. We're on the same page. We're on the same page. <laughs> cool. Because chapter 10 hasn't gone on the net yet, but... We did that last week. How are you guys finding book group? Great. Yeah, have you been uh, following along or just having a little catch up when I come along? <laughs> <laughs> Either one is fine. Catch up, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's fine. I feel that um, every week I just think, oh, this is so amazing. I, can I be up to actually teaching this or leading a group through this? There's so much. Um, and this chapter, I feel, is very beautiful. So I'll do my best to guide us through it. I'm sure you guys all had realizations about it. So. Yeah, so let's just launch in, hey, and we can talk as we go. What was the first big truth that hit you guys in this chapter? So we've just, he's just met Marie, hasn't he, and heard her story. And then in chapter 10, he, um, Kushner gave him a little bit of an explanation about why it was significant that Marie tell her story. And, and Fred also became really um, almost incensed again that I need to get back to Earth to help people to understand what it's really like here. And Kushner has just told him some hard truths about how mediumship actually operates on the, on the Earth. Um, so that's where we start the chapter. So who can tell me the biggest thing that Fred learns first up? Yes, 
I was really um, glad when I read this first sentence because I thought, oh, I'm not the only one. So it's that minute that you get hit with um, a damper on your passion and desire, if you like, yeah. and, uh, and you don't want to accept that truth. I'm like, oh, good on you. I get that too. Because <laughs> he said he, he, when he goes into disappointment, yes. doesn't he? He feels yeah. like, oh. I know what that's like. Yeah, mm. yeah. And it takes him a bit to come out of that because Krishna wants to tell him something else. And what does Krishna start um, bringing to his attention? Yep. Uh, the home of the Assyrians. Yes. And the scene before. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what does he start? What occurs to Fred that's never occurred to him before? Says the concept of labour. Um, and then he finds out, which I'm so excited about, there's no work in heaven. <laughs> it's just your joy. Yeah. Because well, there's work and there's work, isn't there? That's what yeah, he's telling you. Yeah, your passion. Yeah. 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 So what did you guys feel about that revelation? <laughs> Eloisa? We are just like, why don't we do that now? Like, you know, we, we toil and we get worried and fearful. We're just like, what's up with us? Yeah. <laughs> Something's wrong with our picture. Yeah. How does, how does Krishna describe their attitude to work? It's at the bottom of page 130. Dave? Before we go there, like, a, a well, actually, no. Let's answer this question, then we'll go there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Seth? Our only incentive to work is love, to produce an outward semblance of that which is born within and which prompts and forms the mainspring of our activity. Yeah, yeah. So... What did that, like Eloise said, she said, why don't we do that now? Mm. What do you think world, the world would look like if, we, mm. if it was like that? Mm. Everybody in their passion. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And just creating from what, what's within them in terms of love. Yeah. 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 My question for you is, do we do that? Do we produce an outward semblance of that which is born within here on Earth? Mm. I think our artists. I think our artists and our, our musicians and all the beautiful creativity is born from within. Yeah. Eloisa, I feel we do, but because of the error in us, our world just seems pretty effed up, really, and it's like just pretty nasty in a lot of areas. And then the things that we think are amazing in comparison to the wonderland of the spirit world, is like nothing, like it doesn't even compare. Yeah. You know, like my biggest imaginings, I don't even reckon get to Siamese's house, hey? Yeah. Like, and that's, remember they've gone down in condition to get to this place, haven't they? Mm. To where Marie was, mm. you could see um, Siamese's house. So they're at the top of the first sphere here. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's interesting to consider what is within us and how, we, how our work becomes a demonstration of that. I have had, have had a little experience of that in the event team, mm -hmm. um, particularly at Lurgan where it's a big hall and there's lots to do. Yeah. And, um, and if, I, if I'm in a place where I feel I've got to push and I've got to do it and that sort of stuff, then it really becomes hard work. Yeah. But if I'm in a place, especially if I've flown all night and I'm tired or whatever, I just think, oh, you know, it'll be great, everything will just happen. And it just does. Yeah. It just flows. People just step in and things happen. And, it, and I know you, uh, you and uh, Jesus have both commented on it sometimes. Hey, you know, you guys don't look quite so ruly anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it can. It when can you just sometimes uh, you just allow, allow it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about if we've got a lot of fear inside of us, though, mm -hmm. and we go to work? Mm -hmm. Eloise, yeah. it's a pretty big disaster. Because you just create more dramas, more issues, mm. more problems. And a lot of it, you don't even like, it, it like starts with one little thing, I speak from experience. And you, you, you end up like so afraid about that, that you don't even notice that even the good stuff. Yeah. You know, you, you just end up with this like tiny, narrow, I don't know, like piece of pizza that you like can't get out of, you know? All you can see is like the sauce. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how, what's the product like? It's a disaster too. Yeah. And no one and no one really feel like everyone kind of like you know, seeing about say drama and like the teaching and the fear like of the kids getting their stuff done for an assignment. Yeah. And it was so bad. 
Yeah. You know, and yet the dumb beautiful drama, like the whole lead up. Yeah. And you just go, wow, like fear really dictates. Mm. So then is it true to say that even here on Earth, we produce an outward semblance of that which is born with fear? Because when I first read it, I went, oh, that's so awesome. Imagine if we did that. Then I thought, hang on, what is within me? Maybe I do that already. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the other interesting thing to consider, he says our only incentive to work is love. So, do you, what do you feel about our incentive to work here? <laughs> Money, <laughs> or to get things, or to get, like when I say get things, emotional things, or, um, or physical things. And so what emotion is driving that? Ooh, a number. Lack. Lack, yeah. Lack fear, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Often it's that, but do you think there's any other emotions that drive that? Self-reliance. Oh, and the need to pr prove I've myself. Need to prove yourself, often mm. that. Like, I'll mm. define my worth by what I create. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Sex. Fear of punishment. Fear of punishment, yeah. If I don't do it, if I don't go and do something, someone's going to be angry with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of sadness and grief in that we're mostly often wanting to avoid something when we are working. So we use it to get away from... Like a distraction? Yeah. yeah. So we're avoiding pain, yeah. Eloisa? Um, one thing I reckon though, sometimes love comes into it. And, and I feel like at the moment with, like sometimes in my past it's been, I've loved what I've done. Yeah. And I've loved the people that I've worked with. Yeah. I think. <laughs> um, but, and I feel now sometimes when Pete and I are out together, it's just lovely. Like it's joyous and the kids are there and it's harmonious, surprise, surprise, but yeah. it is. And you go, wow, maybe the world could be different. Yeah. And that excites me. Yeah. Because I think that and it's fun. Yeah. So maybe love is sometimes in our work. Yeah. What about, Joan said, it's self-reliance. Is it self-reliance to work? Well, it can be either. You can do it in a self-reliant way where I feel I've got to do everything and it's all push, push, push. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's always been very um, self-involved um, about how it's going to look and what results are and whether it'll fail and so it's all about me. But at the same time, it can be work that I'm just loving to do, yeah. even if it's preparing a meal, yeah. and I can just love the process and, and then give the results up to God. So it can be either way, depending on... I agree. What's wrong? Yeah. What about um, if we have a family, caring for our family? What about caring for ourselves personally? Yeah. I feel we've got an, uh, well, I've got a, an issue with the, even the idea of work because what I see as work, I don't feel probably will be. Like just from what I've observed with you guys and also beginning to realise about myself, like when I'm in a more loving space of my own, cleaning up the house isn't work. It's just that it kind of just happens. Yep. And so I feel like we've got this sort of, and you, and you meet some people who just love their work, yep. and it's not work for them. Yep. And I, I feel like we've got this sort of, I don't know, weird idea, uh, compartmentalisational <coughs> thing going on with everything. Yeah. And I feel like if imagining if we were sort of more of our true selves and sort of really with more God, yeah. I don't think you'd feel that. Because you would never be working, you'd be doing... You'd be engaged in your passion. Yeah, uh, like Yvonne said, you'd be engaged in something you love, giving up the results, you know, without you not having the investment in your importance on this, your fear in this, your feeling that my worth is attached to this thing. You'd just be doing the thing motivated by love. And yeah, and you wouldn't think of it as work. Has anyone ever worked in a job like that? Yeah. Long time ago. But this idea um, about self reliance, do you think if you're God reliant, you would never care for yourself? Like, do you think God created it that we would never have to um, use any effort or use our will? Seth? In another chapter, it was talking about um, if we've 
done with the corral because they did everything they possibly could yep. then God was able to come in and do the rest yes so I've had, I have this policy that if I do everything I can then I can't do any more than that and then I can be at peace with what happens yes God desires for us to use our will in engaging our life that he wants us to know ourselves and express ourselves and part of that is our will and our desire and I feel there's a sort of a fallacy that exists that if I'm God reliant I just hand everything over to God and I just kind of, I don't have any responsibility to pay my bills or look after the children that I've desired to have or to, you know, to pay my rent. When I don't feel that God has that attitude, he's actually desiring for us to grow in love and part of love is taking responsibility for what we've created. Um, for me, when I, took, when, I want, when I wanted to take responsibility for myself and apply for work, in that work process, even though I love it so much about it, I am confronted with with angry women, with demands, with um, you know people that don't you know that all my all my own fear. Like I'm shaking a lot of the times. So I'm yeah. I'm there, which is a gift for me of my own law of attraction and and being able to expose myself and be humble with people in the moment. So I'm learning more about um, just connecting. Yeah. And being humble in that space of one-on-one -on -one interactions with people. Yeah, that's lovely. And there is a theme in this chapter that hopefully will come out, which is about honouring the principles of love and truth above making ourselves comfortable. And when we honour the fact that it is loving to care for ourselves, often it makes us uncomfortable. But if we honour that principle and we're humble, we often grow even further in love. Yeah. But that's skipping ahead a bit. Let's keep going. <laughs> What's next in the chapter? It's very beautiful what um, Krishna relates to him about the idea of working, isn't it? Mm. Oh, Dave had a question or a comment. Uh, um, just a comment. Um, just um, heaven is not at present a perfect place. Mm. Uh, yeah, which was uh, from Krishna. Yeah. Yes. He said to answer your last question first. Heaven is not at present a perfect place. I know such is the earth idea, but it is unscriptural and has not a shadow of justification in the teaching of Jesus who told his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was your feeling about that, David? Um, a little confusion in that, I suppose, uh, in, in your and AJ's teachings, you know, about being celestial and, and heaven and, and everything being perfect. Uh, and kind of grappling with the idea that, that yeah, that there is work, but it's not toiling kind of thing. Yeah. But I'm also thinking, well, are they actually in heaven or in a lower sphere kind of thing? Well, well, I think you need to engage your heart a little bit in understanding what Kushner said. Mm. What do you think he means? What's the lesson he's trying to tell Fred? That heaven is actually partly up to us, in a sense. No, I think I don't think that's what he's trying to say. Can anyone else sort of feel the less? It's just a simple lesson that he's trying to reinforce to Fred, Susan. I feel like that learning and growth is in, um, infinite, and yeah. so wherever we are, there's always going to be more, and we're always going to desire more, and we're always going to have this exciting sense of well, what else is there to learn you know yeah i believe that's true but i don't believe that's what Krishna's is trying to say uh -huh. teresa i think it has for me it felt like you know we can still express our creativity and our, our desires to create and if yeah. it's perfect we wouldn't have anything to do yeah part of our personal expression is to create and so he's saying there's still opportunities to do that but this very first thing that he's saying to him remember he says i'll answer your last question first which is really about the, the nature of the spirit world eloisa um i feel like i uh, i feel it's about that um quote with with jesus going to play to prepare a place for us is that well your guy's soul is the first soul that um expands and has expanded and so it's that expansion that's creating heaven well, i mean i think heaven's already created but so like it's keep you're keeping it's keeping being prepared i don't know I yeah know. yeah but he's saying by definition it's not perfect okay. uh, I, I think perhaps it's um when we do reach the fullness of our potential 
in that way we create perfection. There's still something up to us to create. Yeah, to and contribute. Yes. And all of you guys are saying beautiful things. And if I was speaking to a Christian audience, maybe this would be more challenging because he's trying to teach him something very basic about the principle of Christianity. That I know what he means. Yes, which is yeah. Um, it, it, it means that uh, the Christians believe once they go to heaven, everything's um, going to be illuminated. It's all beautiful. It's all Nothing wonderful. Is. It's all yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Once, you, once you make that step, it's yeah. all over. It's beautiful. And you guys have like <laughs> come over that truth a long time ago. So you're all like way up there with the higher truths, which all of which everything you've said is true. But um, Christians basically just trying to say to you, look, even Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to, I'm going to go and grow more in love and, mm. and create this environment mm. that you can come and be in but it's not it's not perfect yet and and as we know and Dave I think you stumbled because he said heaven he said heaven because he's trying to refer to the afterlife because that's how Christians refer to the afterlife uh, in terms of heaven or hell and Kushner is trying to say look it, it, it's not all illuminated once you pass. There's still learning and growing that's happening here. Um, and also then he goes on to say, there's still the expression of passion and desire and, and um, having, he gives all those examples of the artists and the sculptors and all these people who, who still want to create their things and why would you deny them of that just because you've passed into the spirit world? Yeah. Okay, was there anything else on that, Eliza? I was, well, in fact, like, often um, you might have, I also felt like they still create because they're artists, but also often, like, a lot of people want to do something, but they don't manage to do it on earth, and suddenly they get to a place in the spirit world and go, wow, I can, I can, yeah. as well, oh, and that obviously comes from my injuries, but... But that is actually a theme in this chapter as well, if you think about later in the chapter, so it's a good thing to raise. There is this idea that... Sometimes you are, what does he say here? Um, let, me, uh, let me ask you also, has not the gardener some ideal to consummate? And shall he be deterred from giving scope to his genius where it may be displayed free from the unpropitious, unpropitious influences against which he may contend on earth? So what does unpropitious mean? I had to look it up. <laughs> oh, no, no. It, it means unfavourable. So he is actually saying, yes, sometimes it's really hard to, to live your passion on earth. Why would God then deny you of really having it in its full expression after you pass? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. I, that quote about I go to prepare a place for you, I think uh, Christians and that believe that Jesus does it all. He, he goes and prepares it. That's it. Nothing else happens. <laughs> <to do. laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, but he means it's an ongoing thing, but they take it as meaning, right, he does it, he did it, wow, well, that's it. And in a sense, he did do it, but just as yes. Cecily said, exactly. it involves our will to mm. actually reach those places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what I got from that, when he said heaven is not at present a perfect place, what kind of came to me was that it's not perfect, but perfect in its methods of obtaining perfection. Um, well, that yeah, that is the truth, isn't it? Yeah. That heaven is, the theme of the book really is showing yeah. us, isn't it? That yeah. love rules it all and there's a perfect yeah. order to what yeah. God yeah. Has, has created. So it always there. comes to me. I yeah. guess I must have made it down <laughs> If you can just speak up a bit, because oh, yeah. sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, that always comes up for me that it, right throughout this book that it gives me so much hope and 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 faith, I guess, because yeah. deep down I must really not believe it yet that it's going to be yeah. a loving environment to yeah. go to. Yeah, yeah. So there's some sadness as well there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Someone else had their hand up. Dave. Yep. I'm not really sure why, maybe I'm getting a bit peepy, but the, the next sentence after that paragraph was Fred. Yeah. I was silent, but my mind grew heavy with the thoughts of Carrie. And it's, it's interesting that he's been full of enthusiasm a lot of the way through, and then the start of the chapter, a shade of depression, and now he's, Kushner's is just told him that there's no toil or labour, but yet his, his mind is heavy. 
And what's what's the issue with that, Dave? Uh, I don't know. It's just something that's, that stood out to me, and it's obviously something in me that that, that brought that you out. You expect Fred not to feel sad? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Why Why would you think that? I don't know, I suppose there's, um, yeah, he's in, he's in the presence of, of a celestial spirit who's giving him all this, this stuff and showing him all this stuff. Do you think Krishna's offended that he feels sad? No, no, it's, I, like I said, I'm not really sure, but it's just an observation that just kind of... It sort out, of feels like it. you feel a bit critical of Fred for feeling disappointed, is that the feeling? It could be. I'm probably being critical of myself in that respect, in, in reflection. To try not to analyse it and just yeah. let yourself feel about it and then you'll know how it relates to you. Yeah. Does anyone else feel this? Anyone? I felt more that um, it was about Fred was just being silent, that there was a lot going on in his mind about taking on all this. It was like a self-reflection of everything that he just learned. Is this, it's, where is this centre? It's the top of page 131. It's just after the work. Ah, oh, yes. <clears throat> you know, my yeah. mind grew heavy with the thoughts of Harry, but I think he's just yeah. reflecting. Well, he's, there's a lot to take on. Yeah. Mm. I, I just saw it completely different. I saw it heady in that there's just so much going on here. Yeah. <laughs> trying to absorb like, more. Wow, I've got to yeah. start yeah. soaking this up. Yeah. yeah. That's how I read it. But certainly mm. he, he feels a bit depressed at the beginning of this mm. chapter and he feels... But I don't understand why why we wouldn't um, admire that in Fred, that he's being humble to his experience. Do you, can you see that, Dave? He's actually being humble to, to everything that's going on around him. He has this massive dream. I want to go back there and help people understand what it means, you know? It's, the way you live your life is going to have such an impact on you. And Kushner gives him some pretty home truths about it's not going to be as easy as you think. Like, to then have a sort of a sinking feeling I feel that's him remember once we talked about riding the wave of desire <laughs> you know he's allowing the sadness that um, that is going to if he doesn't allow that sadness he's going to hold on to it and it's actually going to impede his desire quite a bit so yeah I feel that um, Susan Mary is it possible too that he, he within that reflection he may have thoughts of the toil on earth and the struggle he had on earth and so that's sort of um, being released a little through that emotion as well or do you think that's... Quite quite possibly. Yeah. I think I, I read it just as Pete did, just that he's like going, whoa, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> information here. Yeah. Uh, it's quite, there's a lot to absorb. Yeah. Yeah. Cess, you had your hand up? Um, and not, um, yeah, no, I've changed my mind. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> I like the bit before. Music and painting, sculpture and architecture have had their plotters and toilers who lived and died unsuccessful and unappreciated quite as much as the labourers of the pick and the shovel. They love their art and heaven's compensation is to be found in the realisation of their hopes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's really beautiful. Yeah, it is. Beautiful. Yeah. Matt? When you guys, uh, um, I suppose it's probably more AJ at first, like moved into a new sphere. Can you just speak up a bit? Oh, yeah. Um, when you guys like moved into a new sphere, what was it like? Like, what was the environment like before you guys start to sort of, I guess, uh, apply your own creative designs to it? Well. AJ's always been the one who's done that until the 22nd, uh, where we did it together. Yeah. It was a, it's probably technically the 36th, but still Soul Union. Let's yeah. not put a number, because yeah. I don't like numbers. But <laughs> um, it, it's actually the environment is created through your soul's condition. So there is no environment before you go there. Yeah. yeah. So you enter it, and it then becomes a reflection of your personality and the love that is now within you. And then as someone else enters, that's affected by the personality of that person and the love that's within them. Yeah. And so on. And the desire you know, the unique personality and desires and passions of each person. So so some of those things might have just happened automatically through desire? They do. 
And you, yes. was, was there any other actual physical <laughs> ac activity? Oh, like labour? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just to answer your question, yeah. yeah. Um, once you reach the celestial heavens, yeah. everything is very much based on pure desire. And so there isn't much manual work that right. you do. Yeah. Obviously, you don't miss that though. You don't miss that. <laughs> <laughs> because it feels as, you feel as connected to the thing as if you were physically constructing it. You know, if you're physically digging a hole in the ground, yeah. um, if you're in your body <laughs> and desirous, you're quite connected to that task, are you not? Yeah. Um, when you can do it with your soul, one of the conditions of being able to do it is that your, the love is so great inside of you that you feel just as connected to that earth as if you were physically moving it yourself. Yeah. So you feel quite connected to, to the creations that you're creating. Yeah. But it's not a manual task as much as a soul one now. <coughs> Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do. Catherine? I've got a small problem. I like physical work. Uh huh. <laughs> I'd much rather be outside doing something than inside sitting with the computer or cleaning the house or that yep. sort of stuff. So, um, and everyone seems to be laughing about physical work and, and it's all um, hard work and not enjoyable. But um, yeah, I, I do enjoy being outside. And, and doing why is it a problem? Well, everyone seems to think that being um, that it is a problem. That's all. Oh, no, no, but no. I, I think I think it's lovely that you enjoyed the physicality of it. Um, and my point about digging the hole: if you enjoy digging the hole physically with your physical body, as it's the same sense of enjoyment that you would have if you do it with your soul, because it. It's very hard to describe, but it is very much like you're physically doing it, but you don't actually have to use your physical or your spirit body to do it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's probably not actually digging the actual hole, but if you put a tree in it and watch the tree grow and all of that ah, sort of stuff. But it, that's something different though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I don't know, you have to do the physical work first. <laughs> yes, but do you enjoy the physical work or do you enjoy the tree growing? No, I quite enjoy physical work. Because yeah. yeah. often people who enjoy physical work are actually very engrossed in the outcome. They feel like, yes, I can see I did something. <laughs> and, and that's actually not a particularly pure place. If we are only addicted to the outcomes and we push through the physicality of it in order to see the outcomes. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When we're doing that, we're actually addicted to a sense of satisfaction rather than being really connected. It's great um, when you're working with Jesus because he is so connected to just the activity and the love in the activity. I really enjoy working with him because it also gives me the space to do that same thing. But I'm used to working with parents or things who are very outcome focused. And so I've got to do it in a hurry and I've got to do it right. And, and, and it takes me all in fear all out of the whole task. When you actually are with someone who really just wants to be present in the task and love each part of it, it feels very liberating actually. Yeah, so something to ponder, Catherine. What is my joy? Is it the doing? Am I connected? Is it the outcome? And for many of us who, who are not involved in physical labour but other types of work, we can have the same addiction, you know? I, I completed that essay. I didn't enjoy doing it, but now, look, I've got it. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. Teresa? <laughs> so what you're saying is that about just being in the moment and enjoying whatever it is you're doing. Well, it's Being actually, connected to yourself and feeling how you are while you're actually doing whatever it is, no matter what. It's more than that. It's being connected to what it is you're doing. Yeah. Do, you, do you see? You're connected not just to yourself, but when we're digging a hole at home, we're connected to, wow, you know, what do we desire for this hole? We're going to make it into a worm farm, you know? Let's, let's be connected to what does it need? Well, I can see it's quite clay. We're going to put some minerals in here and do... It, it actually leads us into the next most loving thing to do. 
Sometimes we need to let it sit for a while and let the birds, you know, work with the mulch until we come along and put the next layer on or whatever it is. But so it's being connected to yourself, but then, and you find this when you are very connected to yourself, you end up being connected to just about everything around you anyway. <laughs> but you, if you're very connected to the love in the task, if you, if you desire to love what you're working on, and, and the, a part of it is loving the outcome, but you're loving the steps along the way. You're loving the desire, actually. What is the loving desire and staying connected to that as you go? Seth? I had a big realisation just in doing the catching up, doing the book group study, um, because I got stuck behind way back at chapter six. I didn't even finish to do chapter six. And I had this feeling of really crestfallen that I'm not going to be part of book group again. And then I realised, well, but I can be if I want to. And there's this whole thing, I love reading, I love the language in this book, I really thrill to it. And, but there's big emotions for me about, I was never allowed to, I felt that I was never allowed to enjoy myself, I got into trouble for laughing. Um, and I'd just be self-indulgent and wasting my time if I lie around reading books. I could do that as a kid, but... Yeah. So I realised that... So since um, Saturday or Sunday, I've been just going out in the paddock with the horse and reading and just a allowing, and it's been such a beautiful experience because at the same time I'm processing and other things got done while I'm watching yeah. a video that have been... I've been like, feeling paralysed because oh, that's what I have to do. Whereas yes. now, because I was doing what I really love to do, all these other things just, and the law of attraction became even more powerful in most challenging ways as well. Yeah. So, so there's a magic in, in letting go of the have to and the, the guilt and all that. All, when we put all those emotions onto us, it's very hard to get anything done actually, isn't it? And yeah. very hard to find any joy in what we're doing. Yeah. But you, you managed to... As soon as I went out in the party, before I'd even barely read a page, I had to lie down and process for ages about, I'm not allowed to do this, I should be working. And it was, so, it was really great. I'm so glad I did it. Awesome. That's good, hey? Yes. All right, let's get on. What's, what's the next thing that happens in our chapter? He learns about work. And what is next? That the house itself. Mm -hmm. House. He turns his attention to Siamese house, doesn't he? Yeah. And what struck you guys about the house? Eloisa? Massive. <laughs> Massive yes. And beautiful. Yes. And like has everything and more than you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And and another thing as well, it's like that every set oh one that earth is blimmin' exhausting. Because everyone has had this blooming good rest before they actually like. <laughs> 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 that really resonated with me. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. exhausted a lot of time. You wanted to book in. Yeah, I was like, can I go to your house? <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> <laughs> Everything was catered for. And I know it's a bit moving here, but like, yeah, every single thing that you could imagine that you need yeah. is there. And there's a special house for every single thing that like like every kind of exhaustion yes. you know so this is the creedal you know the world uh, creedal you know religious one yeah i didn't quite understand what that probably meant but yeah you know whereas the corral was like a completely different healing home you know yeah and i was like that, i mean i just get a bit blown away that god like caters to everything you know yeah. and loves me so much because i don't think about that much yeah for anyone mm. yeah yeah so that, that's real. did anyone else find that in this section, just how much mm. we're given a, a sort of a visual representation mm. and metaphoric representation of how much love is inherent in this environment? Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. And I'm not so sad about that, this whole chapter. Like obviously there's skipping ahead that there's parental stuff and whatever. I just thought, you know, it's the, it's the love. It's the lack of love that I've given and the lack of love that I've received and just how loving it's supposed to be. Mm. Yeah, yeah. 
And what did it bring up for anyone else? Any other feelings? Teresa? Um, the description of the trees and everything around and all the flowers and stuff, it felt really like the living structures that AJ was talking about somewhere. Yeah. 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 And, and it's just, it was like this great big growing alive thing. Yeah, and what did that make you feel? I loved it. I loved yes. it. Yes. Yeah. It was just cool. Yeah. 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 Um, well, yeah, I mean, it did. It brought me back to the living structure stuff. So it kind of connected you with the mm. desire for something. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Catherine? To carry on from oh. Teresa's, I, I, this is probably a silly question, but um, everyone up there is in spirit. You know, they haven't yes. got their physical body. Yeah. Now, are the trees and the flowers and even the building, mm. now, is it... Are they all live like they are on Earth? You know, is the grass... <laughs> yeah. Is the grass live in the trees? And, and is, the, is the actual ten-storey building, is that live too? Well, what do you guys think? What do you think? How would you answer that question? Matt? Definitely. Oh, yeah, it's definitely yeah. live. But it's got a, um, a different kind of life energy, maybe? Than trees and stuff here. Got a different yeah. feeling. Yeah, what does everyone else think? It's Michael? It's about so below. Yeah, you think it's very much the same. Yeah. yeah. Teresa? But I've heard AJ say before it's actually more real and more solid and more. I don't know, vibrant, more colours, everything's more. Yes. So mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to. This being all washed out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to wait. What's the other opportunity we have here? So, so does that mean it's like physical? Yes. So yes, yeah. it is. It is no. like matter. It is like, as Teresa says, it is more it feels just as real as it feels like we have physical bodies now when we're in our spirit form permanently it feels like we have a, a solid body it's made of matter and it feels like we're in a body and there's physical things we can touch often we have this kind of you know idea of the spirit world where it's all clouds and and you know and transparent and it's a very big belief on the earth but it's actually really real it's just more real and more colorful but as michael said janet if you can just be if everyone can be conscious of the camera it's just an issue of love for everyone else so yeah um as michael points out it is God does have a kind of a system of things that is in parallel with what happens here. It's not a completely different land. Things do grow there. Mm -hmm. Things do, there is matter that, and in the, the home of the Assyrian that we're at now, we're not in the celestial realm, so everything isn't living. It is matter. It's obviously of a higher development of love. So some things within it are living, like we see the tree of, Water. Yeah. Water. Yeah. Water. Yeah. And the water too. Yes. And the river. It has. Yes, which is very beautiful. What do we learn about the river? Where's oh, it coming from? It's coming from, it's coming from, from the Jesus. throne of God. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, or it's believed that's where it's coming yeah. from. the throne of yeah. God. Yeah. So this is a place that's very connected to the celestial realm, isn't it? Yeah. Eagle? <laughs> and no shadow be uh, surprising. There's no shadows. No shadow shadows. Yeah. There's no nighttime either. Well, yeah. That was a question I had. Was is is there sunshine, like, or is it just light, or does it have a sun? Uh, it's yeah. There's no sun. No, there's no sun. No, there's no, no sun rises. Sun. Sun. No, it doesn't. No, no. And there's no sorry, There's no rain for the river. Do you think there's no rain? I don't know. <laughs> well, there was rain before. Yeah, remember they were walking as they were going down, there was like a mist, yeah. wasn't there? Yes. But yes. there was, no, but it had some kind of property that was acting upon their clothes, didn't it? <laughs> Matthew? I felt it interesting that, um, that Fred's like uh, first taking us to meet Marie yeah. and then taking us to meet these guys. Yeah. And it wasn't Fred actually, though, was it? 
Kushner. Oh, no, no, yeah. in, terms of, in terms of Fred um, telling the story to RJ Lee. Yeah. Like, that there's a real kind of showing us one possibility and then showing us it, like, probably up the other end of the scale possibility in terms of how we can pass yes. the condition yeah. that we can be in, depending yeah. on the, the choices that we make. And yeah. Yeah. And that's a beautiful quality of this this whole book, isn't it? It's, it's basically an explanation of all the different things that can occur as you pass. Yeah, and how it's governed by your soul condition. Yeah. It brought up quite a bit of grief for me because um, I realised that I'm not going to pass in that condition <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say that's a fairly heavy um, <laughs> judgment to make for the rest of unless you're going to pass that. You qualify for yeah, saying yeah, pass yeah, in this moment. Yeah. 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 But in answer to your question, Catherine, about the rain, there are things that resemble rain at times. So cleansing forces and things like that. And also, remember here, we're not in the hells. We've spent very little time so far in, in hellish conditions in the first sphere. So even the issues about work and toiling, how do you think they are in the lower, lower parts of the first sphere? Mm. 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 What do you think? Mm. Hard, yeah. yeah. Why is that? Because mm. people's belief systems. Because mm. of people's belief systems, yeah. yeah. That are holding them in an error-based thing, believing mm. that they have to toil. Mm. But as soon as the spirit world is organised, so in the very lower realms of the hells, there's not a lot of organisation. But as soon as it becomes more structured and organised in the way that people live and the way things run, it, it is, everyone does have a, have a job, if you like. Mm. They, have a, they have a work. So it's, it's, this is why I was raising this issue, is it loving to have a work? Because it is actually a loving thing to have, to have a, mm. an occupation, something that you do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's just that we're used to having, we're used to trying to meld ourselves into a, um, into a, mm. into a role that we don't necessarily always want to mm. take mm. because of other mm. feelings that we have. Yeah. You want? Because um, it makes the point in here that it's not just about love, it's about love for humankind. And so, same, same in heaven as it is here on earth, mm -hmm. you would want to, if you, if there's going to be love for human, for, for your brothers and sisters, then you would want to do work to help that. Yes, mm -hmm. and and this is the interesting thing about the nature of love, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That when we practice it in a in a pure sense, or when we practice it at all, we honour love of self, but also love of others. Mm -hmm. It's it's quite impossible mm -hmm. to just love yourself and not love other mm -hmm. people, or just love other people and not love yourself. You can develop different parts of that, but in, in the end there's going to be a conflict. You're going to have to resolve that because pure love in its pure form loves everything. Yeah. Yeah. Teresa? Well, just going back to the thing about the different colours and different physicalities. Yes. From what you were saying, are you you're saying that there is a possibility that we could have as dense or have, um, the vibration or whatever the frequency it is up there, around there. Yeah. Um, can that be on the physical earth? What do you think? What does anyone think? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so how would it be possible, Seth? In fact, I believe that's what you've come to show us. Thanks for not missing that. <laughs> and how would we create that, Pete? Well, it's going to be this relationship with love, is my feeling. Um, what I really got excited, like, you hear him talking about the loosely flowing robe and it's electric grey, and yeah. it's like electric grey, and it's yeah. like, because you hear the guides and the spirits talking, like, we hear, hear them so often talking about colours and how yeah. they're not like the colours that we imagine, and, you know, just a dull colour like grey is electric, and, you know, it looks really impressive. Yeah, um, yeah. Because he's talking there about Siamese, isn't he? Yeah. And what do what do we learn about Siamese in the way that he looks? What do what can Fred already feel from him in his demeanour? Regal. That he's so regal. Regal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? I was going to say monarchical. Yeah. <laughs> like, like a monarch. But what kind of monarch was he? Oh, very loving. But it's a love that creates this effect. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dave. And and he has an air and attitude of service. 
yes, so yeah. yes, very much, isn't it? And and there's that beautiful imagery of how he, even his presence is conveying all of these qualities that he has, of service and love and and this this regalness about his demeanour. That's all just because of the love that he that he has. Yeah, Karina. Um, I was quite surprised that he held a scepter, you know, um, and had a diadem, yes. uh, like a throne and a, a staff type thingy. Yeah. Um, but I loved reading it, the, what the scepter did, he said, while the scepter he swayed radiated an influence in the presence of which revolt and treachery would have been annihilated, the gems with which it was set excited no greed or avarice, while it was wielded not with a mandate of destruction, but a command to live. The hand of the tyrant or oppressor could not grasp it, neither could the stain of blood ever touch it, for that emblem of rule divine has come from the hands of God, who had himself engraved upon it the name of love. Yeah. That was just so powerful. Mm -hmm. Like, that not, like, you know, that just the whole thing about love winning over evil? Yeah. That, we're so used to cowboys and Indians here where the baddies win, you know, and here was my Sir Lancelot, you know, yeah. winning with love. Yeah. Nothing could touch that, that yeah. scepter. Yeah. It changed my whole idea about scepters. That's what I was going to say, when you go to your scepter you go, ooh, and why is that? Because on the earth, how have scepters been portrayed to us as, as a power, mm -hmm. as a power Dominate. symbol, as someone who has dominance, yeah. when really it, it's actually displaying that Siamese has dominion over his home, doesn't he? Mm. He, he ha He's a protective force yeah. on his home, isn't he? Mm. But it's all through love and so it's not threatening and it doesn't make anyone feel diminished in his presence. Yeah. 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 And also the way it said that it was um, that God himself had come from the hands of God and God himself had engraved on it the name of love. And when it said about that river from the source of love, and then it talked about how the waters of the river did all this amazing mm -hmm. healing that yes. was unique to that individual. But that was the hands of God. So it really brought God so much closer to me, those images. Yeah, I want to talk a bit more about that as we go on. Um, Yvonne, did you have something on that? No, um, I was just going to say something um, that uh, Corinne reminded me about, and that is that the description of this man and just the way he holds himself in his presence, there's obviously so much love just emanating from him. Mm -hmm. It's just a beautiful example to us of, as to what lies before us and what is possible for him and what God wants for us. Mm -hmm. It's just, it, it, it is, it's just a demonstration of living love. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I, it's interesting how Karina you said it, it connected me more to God, like this feeling of the love that God has for us. And and reading that this whole passage of where he's entering Siamese home and seeing Siamese and, and the tree of life and all of those things, to me it was a, such a huge demonstration of the love that God has for us. And... Um, and which brings me back to this idea that Teresa raised that can we have this here on earth? And Seth said, I believe that's why you're here, mm -hmm. and I agree. But can anyone, can anyone see or say how that is going to actually happen? Why isn't it here now? If, God, if we know God has that amount of love for these people in the spirit world, do you think it's different for us? No. 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 Yeah. So why isn't it like that here? I love it when everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Mel? I should say fear. Yeah, what fear? Um, everyone's own individual fear then becomes a collective force and it affects other living, stops, prevents love from growing. Yeah. What do we do to the environment when we sit in our fear? Degrade it. Degrade it. Yeah. You stagnate and degrade and project. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else we do? Uh, Matt? Oh, sorry. No? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Teresa? It's sort of like it stunts the growth um, and it's, uh, the potential basically diminishes. Um, yeah. And, and how does that happen? Matt? 
or at least that last little bit. Oh, how does it happen? How does it happen that we affect the environment around us? Um, yeah. Uh, part of it's to do with the emotions that we're projecting out. Yes. And that it actually damages the people and the environment around us. Like it actually impacts it and causes it to degrade. Yeah. Um, I also feel that it, um, it, when you live, when we're living in our fear, everyone's going around not being the real then. Yes. And so it's like a whole, a whole globe, a whole society, global society of no one really being themselves. Being themselves, so yeah. And so it's very hard to. Uh, for God's love to become really present in like our society and the actions that we take and stuff. Because we're not making a direct connection with God, you mean? Yeah. But also, remember a lot of these people inside me this time are not yet making a direct connection with God. Mm -hmm. And yet they're in an environment that is in infinitely loving towards them and healing them. Mm -hmm. So what is different here? Teresa? The only thing I'm thinking of now is that love is such... Um, like exponentially more powerful force than fear um, that because we're choosing to, to be in fear that we're not um, being as powerful as we could. No, I don't feel it's about that. Uh, Karina? Well, these people that are in his home, they were exhausted from well-doing. Mm -hmm. So they were brave enough to stand for truth mm -hmm. and whereas we create um, disease and, and degrade the, um, the earth because about, we choose our errors and addictions. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. More? Susan? Yeah, I was going to say too that we use our free will not to engage our passions and desires mm -hmm. and so therefore we don't have that um, pulling us towards God and pulling us towards uh, creating heaven here on earth, really. Yeah. 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 Yes, also true. There's more. Mel? Um, I was just saying what's preventing that from happening here is um, originally what I said about fear, but also when you're in that state of fear and it expands to become a collective, the individual becomes more sort of um, self-obsessed and there's that lack of humility, so yes. that lack of desire to get out of that fear, to, to want love, to want love for everyone around you, to want love for God. So, yeah. I don't know, I'm, I guess I'm feeling it's that lack of humility. Yes, yeah. yeah. What yourself and Karina are saying is exactly what, that's exactly what happens in our souls um, that has an impact, but no one's yet saying what we physically do. What do we physically do as a result of these things? Laura? Take. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we take, and where do we take from? The environment. The environment. Everything, the environment. Yeah. Everything in our environment, don't we? Mm -hmm. So the, the full um, healing properties of a tree that's just out here, how do, you, do you think that that is how God created the healing properties in that tree? Mm -hmm. No. So why not? Because of all the things you've been saying, actually. Mm -hmm. Because of... But it's also because we've physically cut down most of the forests. Mm -hmm. You know, we've physically gone out and really interfered with nature, which God created, haven't we? Mm -hmm. And then we've emotionally held on to fear and addiction and mm -hmm. let that rule everything, which also impacts on every living organism around us. So we're actually taking things and we're, we're letting fear have be the ruler of us. And so God's love, we're actually using our will in opposition with God, aren't we? Yeah, um, it just struck me, if Adam and Eve started off in the Garden of Eden, then this is what it's become, what we are in now. And so, of course, it can go back to that. It can. And how different do you imagine the Garden of Eden was to the place that Fred's here? Oh, sounds like it's the same. Yeah. And that is, that is a place where God, the properties that God desired to be in every aspect of nature were there. Because before Adam and Eve made the decision, to choose something, to choose self-reliance and to, to try to have dominion over their environment rather than being in um, harmony with God. Before that point, everything in their environment was how God desired it to be. Mm. Yeah. 
I reckon that's why God had to make it that when you go into the spirit world, it's like these are the laws, and if you don't stick to them, you reap the benefits. Otherwise, you'll just create the same thing here. And we're not having that. You'll destroy everything. You know, now you're going to learn. But in a nice way. But in a nice way. Eat enough is enough. In a real way. Yeah, like. <laughs> well, we talked about that, didn't we, in one of the earlier chapters about the mercy that God has actually. God is giving us the opportunity here on earth to make a few mistakes and learn. You know? <laughs> <laughs> made a few, more than a few. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but he's giving us this opportunity to turn the boat around, isn't he? And through the use of our wills, which is a very beautiful gift, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To let us learn in that. Yeah. Without restricting like we can still be with the trees here mm. you know a lot of us with the level of taking emotions that we might have had at different times in our life or the level of anger or whatever we wouldn't even be able to get near the tree of life but God's still given us trees here mm -hmm. that we can go and sit under and if you've ever sat under a really old tree mm. it's pretty mm. even with how far we've strayed it's still pretty has healing pro you can kind of feel it can't you yeah. that, the calmness of it and the, the gentleness of it. Mm. So if you imagine that on like hyperdrive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. imagine sitting under a tree that as God desired it to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'm just sitting here wondering um, how does uh, how how will or does earth changes come work to balance it, bring the balance um, back to the world? create this well work. let's let's answer that question logically mm. if if catastrophic earth changes happen mm. how would that rebalance things uh, well for, for, for instance um, people will start going back to sort of having to live closer to the earth um, and, and become more attuned to it to um, uh, I was thinking in those terms perhaps yeah mm -hmm. Yvonne um, I think the balance is only going to come, earth changes or not, by um, all the waves of love that God does send on the planet, and earth changes would be another one of those, in terms of um, how our soul development in improves and how we grow in love, because the planet is only going to reflect our soul condition, mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and that's the only way. So we can go out and do actions, but they're not going to be long lasting as we you know as we've talked about before the only thing that's going to have any lasting impact mm -hmm. is um, if our soul condition changes and grows and that, and with that we have more of a desire to to show love for everything around us our brothers and our sisters and the um, and the environment yep. and and I just had a, was having a little think there a minute ago about I remember him having a discussion with Peter about the property here and how one of the reasons it's so dry and so cold is because we've denuded it of the trees and, and that as we, as our soil condition improves and as the land improves here and the temperature will change and he talked about the fact that you're not so, in fact I think Pete's guys talked to him about the fact that they never depended on rain <coughs> because you had this lovely mist, there was enough humidity yeah. in, the, in the tropical forests mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. everything to survive. Yeah. And, and I further wondered from that is whether the amount of rain we get when we get it is an indication of how much we need to cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. It's a sign of the grief we need to feel. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Eloise, you had your hand up on that one? Oh, yeah, but it was for something else. So, okay. like, in the sense of it was pre what we've just discussed. Yeah. So no worries. Yeah, but I, I believe that Yvonne is right. Our soul has the most power over our environment. Like God's created us as the highest of these creations. Mm -hmm. That means that what's within me is going to have the most impact on the tree um, more than some other change. Now, if it's true, if people are forced towards a mm -hmm. sense of being more connected mm -hmm. to the earth, Perhaps that would make a change, but personally, I and I've probably spoken about it publicly before. I have quite a bit of resistance to this concept that Earth changes will be the salvation of humanity and we'll all suddenly be loving, because I know <laughs> that it takes the hearts of people, and I've seen very many people living in very extreme amounts of hardship 
who didn't necessarily feel suddenly grateful or suddenly uh, in tune with the earth or suddenly, <laughs> do you know? So yeah. it, it does require our hearts to change. Um, if, if love is to grow under any condition, it requires our hearts to change. Yeah, Matthew? I guess for me, like God seems like such a big part of it and gradually becoming more God reliant. Because if you're not, like when you're God reliant, mm. when you have a desire, you ask God. Kind of like you have the desire and you feel the desire and connect to God kind of thing. But if you're not connecting to God, then, well, you're going to have to get it somewhere else. And so then there's that really strong taking, like, well, I'm going to have to take it from somewhere then. Well, let's talk about God reliance then, because w w how do you understand God reliance to be, Matt? Um, You're saying you feel the desire, and then yeah. what happens? Um, like, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? I don't necessarily agree that you have to have God to become more um, loving or to love your environment or to make the changes because you can self-reliantly become more loving yes. in yourself. I agree. And I don't... Um, yeah. Everyone in the six spheres done that. Yeah. And, and that's like them. five spheres above what we're reading about. Yeah. So I feel like it's actually just, if you've got the emotion in you of taking, it doesn't matter whether you love God and whatever, well, it will change you if you're truly passionate about God, because eventually that you're going to want to change. Well, but you've got to make a choice first, you've got to take an action to do something. Well, and I think, I think what you're saying is you have to have a desire within you to grow in love, to yeah. make a choice for love and truth. And that, that is a theme in this chapter, as we see later on. If you make that choice then, and act in accordance with that choice, then this will affect things around you. It will affect your soul condition. But why do we harp on about God so much? He's <laughs> <laughs> a fast way there. He's a fast way. Laura, did you have your I was just going to say it, it's the same with earth changes, like even if you know the cataclysmic event happens it's still going to require the individual choice uh, to be loving because if we're taking and earth changes come we'll probably some people can choose still to be more fear and take even more so. exactly yeah and and just going back to the question I asked Matt I feel when we're God reliant we act we feel a desire and we act on it requesting feedback from God Mm -hmm. uh, can you help me purify this desire? Get, let me know what's out of harmony with this desire so that it can be the most loving desire. But we act, you know, and we do things. This is this thing I was saying earlier about it's not really a passive state. Yeah. My experience has been that you don't have to ask for the feedback, it comes. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to be humble. To be ready be, for it. Yeah. You've got to want to use that feedback, otherwise you, you're becoming self-reliant. You try to, you know, go. Oh no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm ignoring that feedback. I'm just going to keep going doggedly towards what I want. Yeah. We're doing it on our own. Then we're not. We're not letting God tell us, show us what we need to learn in order to grow in love. Yeah, Teresa. That um, brings me to a question that I had about that chapter. Yeah. Um, about my motivation for seeking God. Mm -hmm. um, this is something I've thought about before, and I thought. Does it matter if the only reason I'm looking for God is so I don't hurt anymore? Or is it, can I use that to um, be more, I don't know, have a more expansive desire, a more pure desire? Does it matter how, yeah, if it's just to get out of the pain? Okay, yeah. that's a good question. Yeah. Who else has the feeling that they sort of, sometimes they feel like the only reason they want God is to get out of pain? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, sometimes, yeah. So let's talk about that. What do you think about that, Laura? Um, if that's where we're at right in that moment, I, I feel to honour where we're at and then to ask for God to pray to, to purify that desire and start to have a relationship with God where you, you, you want that and there's nothing wrong with expressing that desire because it's the truth and God knows the truth. 
Yeah. But then eventually <coughs> that desire will get purified in, in the process of that engaging that desire. That desire, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Matt? Um, I personally find that my relationship with God, uh, because um, I would like to grow in my humility more, um, uh, it's very painful a lot of the time. Like There's a lot of pain that comes up and God's constantly showing me where the error is and stuff like that. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, so what's, finish your point. Um, so I, I feel like eventually the pain goes down, but... Um, yeah. But if you enter the relationship just to get out of pain, <laughs> is it going to work? It's not going to work. work. <laughs> You're going to back out. <laughs> not where I thought I was yeah. It's like wanting a friend so you don't feel lonely. You know, you got to feel the lonely before you're going to have a true friendship. Otherwise, you're only going to see that person when you don't feel lonely, and it's not really a friendship. It's a non-loneliness ship. You know. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Kate? Uh, I was just aware of the irony in it too because God can't really even begin to help us until we're willing to embrace our pain. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I think that's a kind of self-reliant way of connecting with God. Like I'm only going to go to God in the last, and I've done this for 65 years. Yeah. That I'm only going to go to God when I'm really desperate and alone. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, can you help me now? Sort of stuff. Like. But, but let's be realistic. <clears throat> How often does that happen? Oh, yeah. 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 It's not the, not the only part of the relationship. Not the only part of the relationship. Yeah. Mel? Oh, I was just going to say that, um, acknowledge that that's where you're at, but just because it's not a physical relationship, it's still a taking relationship. So you've got to mm -hmm. desire to mm -hmm. want God in a pure form because you want to be the love that he wants us to be. Yes, um, so it gets back to desire. Um, and just acknowledging that this is where I am at the moment, God, you know, it's a taking friendship. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. You, you're wanting from God to, as, as lots of you pointed out very eloquently, you know, there's an addiction actually that you're wanting to set up with God <coughs> and it will backfire. <laughs> you know, you, it's not gonna, you're not going to get far before God's wanna, going to want to confront you with, this is not going to work, my daughter. You're going to have to actually embrace pain in order to, to grow. Yeah. yeah. What do you feel about that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I feel, and I'm getting better at feeling the pain, but it still feels like that's the driving force behind it, is to just to be happy. And yeah. I'm not sure if the pureness of that desire isn't, well, maybe not so much to get out of pain, but to, to just be happy is that... Yeah, this, this can I put to you a, a different desire? Rather than desiring to be happy, could you desire to be whole? Could you desire to be all of Teresa? Whether that's painful or pleasurable or joyful or fearful or, and whether that takes you in a direction where you never have gone before, or down a path of desire that of creativity that you never thought you would ever that would be a part of you that's the kind that's the sort of thing that that's the desires that we're going to need to have in order to have a relationship with god mm -hmm. this feeling that i'm going to trust you god and and i'm going to desire not only to know you but to know me both desires we really need if we're going to grow towards god you know, and, and right now me is not that happy. <laughs> or happy sometimes, but there's sadness sometimes. And, and yes, it's true that when we really grow in this relationship with God, sadness will be a thing of the past. So it, it's not bad to want joy, <laughs> you know, it's not. But if that's your only, for example, if you want to be happy without being whole, it's impossible in a true sense. Do you know, you have to, by, by using the word whole, I mean to really know yourself, to really embrace everything that's in you right now, but also the potentials of things, the great things that are within you. You have to, you have to desire, be willing to face your fear of both those things, I suppose. You're not going to have a desire for them, right, I've got that, you know, because otherwise you'd already be experiencing them. So there's going to be fears to face as we do that, to embrace everything that's in us now and then everything that we have the potential to be, that's also scary sometimes, yeah. 
Um, but that's the kind of desire that will carry you very close to God. So I agree with what the girl said about being real with where you're at and just engaging God in, in that right now and saying, look, this is how I feel right now. Can you give me truth about this? Can you show me how this is going to be going to work and be beautiful? Yeah. But I don't think you're alone in that feeling, Teresa, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of a lot of people feel that it would just be good to be out of pain <laughs> and um, feeling like there's a lot of pain. But as we develop humility, we'll develop the willingness to not only experience the pain, but just experience what God is bringing to us, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good question. Mm-hmm. How are we going for time, guys? Is it... Quarter past two. Quarter past two. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's go back to the chapter. Where are we up to? The house. (laughs) The house, yeah. So we're talking about the beauty of and the love that's inherent in everything there, hey? And the scepter. And the scepter. The awesome scepter. Yeah. Yeah. And what else struck you in this? For me, I have to um, confess, I find... Because of my grief, I find it difficult to read the, the really beautiful descriptions. I, I find, I feel the real sense of loss and a feeling of, um, it's just too beautiful. I can't attend to, I can't even let myself imagine it sometimes. I, I try to, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I'm not doing it. Um, yeah, so, but I was just really moved by how much love was being shown to these people. So Paul. Do you remember that these things, Mary? Well, that's why I resisted, Paul, because the, the memory comes with the emotion, you know, and so yeah. there's a feeling, if I remember it, I'll feel just such a loss about it, mm-hmm. and um, that is something I need to do. Mm-hmm. This is why it's good for me to do this book, because it's all in the spirit world. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I say that to Jesus, like, what am I doing? <laughs> this is so confronting. <laughs> it's beautiful again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's a... I resist re- remembering it a lot, you know. Yeah. It's one of the ironies, and maybe it's for all of us, that sometimes the most beautiful, loving things trigger the most pain. Mm-hmm. I can remember lots about my first century life on earth because it was pretty painful and, you know, but when it comes to really remembering soulmate union or remembering the spirit world, it feels like an even bigger sense of grief in me, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I still often block that, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's good when I don't though because I feel quite connected to it. Yeah. And that's part of your journey is to is to recall those things, or those things will come up as you deal with emotions along the way. Well, really, I'm attracting um, opportunities to to remember to to be humble to the pain and have a full memory of it, Paul. Actually, uh, um, that is part of the the knowledge of all these things comes with the, the memory, and with the memory comes the emotion. So. Mm-hmm. You know, when we started the book, I was going off to AJ every five minutes and going, what does this mean? What do you think this is? And he's like, just remember it. <laughs> you know? and, but he'd explain to me. And then as we go on, I'm a bit more humble. And I know. I'll, I'll go and say, look, this is what this means, isn't it? He says, yes. And that's because I've let myself remember more and like grieve more, really. Um, but, but that's how you can have the difference between myself and AJ right now. He's more humble to the emotional experience, so the truth is is flowing back within him. Mm-hmm. Because I'm not as humble to that, then I'm still I'm still trying to be Mary Luck, you know, mm. instead of Mary Magdalene. I'm still trying to operate in self reliance rather than if I'm just humble to the grief in me, then truth flows to me. I know it without having to learn it. Mm-hmm. Um, but because of my fear of the intensity of the emotions, often I don't do that. Which is pretty illogical, isn't it? <laughs> 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 just to myself speak. They're pretty realistic. You know? <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. So, I think it's interesting that um, uh, that Fred felt himself involuntarily drawn to Siamese. 
Um, so I'm also wondering when you read that, that you, oh, so just before I asked it, I, I knew what I was going to ask you as well, but um, something like, do you feel that some in, sometimes that touches you, I guess what you're saying, when you allow it, you'll feel yeah, yeah. that all of this is... Yes. The best chapters are, are when I just have a big cry when I read it because then I, you know, mm -hmm. I feel it all. But why do you think it was involuntary? involuntary? Because of the love. Because it's of the love. just mm -hmm. so beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. And also, do you, Siamese's desire, I think, to he had a loving desire to embrace Fred, and he just felt himself mm -hmm. drawn. And I think because Fred has is is so like wow and <laughs> open and excited and yeah. so, even though he's overwhelmed he's yeah. yeah like he's yeah. really engaged yeah and that's just beautiful isn't it like we we're saying Dave at the beginning you know it was sort of confronting that he's feeling sad but that's a part of his humility in this he's just like I'm having this huge experience and now there's something else and oh 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 you know he's mm. it's just all overwhelming him and that's how we grow mm. through being overwhelmed. I think it's just a great example of being like a child. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's just like every moment is a new discovery almost. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Really lovely. And but it's even fun. better because you're in this awesome wonderland where like everything <laughs> like happens that like yeah. is like beyond your wildest imaginings. Yeah. But what humility does that take, eh? Hey? Courage. <laughs> Courage to just be in an environment that you cannot understand or control. Mm -hmm. You are completely having to trust these guides who yeah. you've only just met. Like he's rather ever been there that long if we consider the narrative. And he's not saying, oh, we spent ages there and we did it. It's just sort of, you know, he's just in this thing with all these new people. And, you know, in the last chapter he felt like, I don't understand that. That distresses me, you know. And he's having to trust some really core principles, isn't he? Like that this trust that they say everything is governed by love, and and just learn. Yeah. Dave. I was reflecting a little bit on, and it's the stuff that's come up this morning is that humility is also about feeling love, yeah. and it's like he's drawn to love, and for me it's like I. I I see me as being drawn to spirits and others to feed my addictions, not to yeah. God, not to my celestial guides and stuff like that. Yeah, Hugh Fred is in this open, yes. humble place. Yeah. And humility allows us to connect with everything. In fact, it is the desire to not avoid anything. And uh, these attractions that happen with um, earthbound spirits and things like that, they're only enabled because we desire to avoid something. Um, Matt, did you have your hand up? Yeah. I was, I was just a question um, with with um, being drawn to love. Yes. For instance, meeting you and Jesus is obviously something in my soul is drawn to love. Hey, okay? yeah. Andrew. So why is it only because of huge injury in people? that they would not be drawn to love at any time? Well, what is it? This is a good question, Eloisa. We can answer it. Mm -hmm. In the group. Yeah. Yeah. Self-worth. Mm -hmm. lack, of, lack of self-worth too. Uh, don't, sometimes. You don't feel you deserve. Sometimes, but that's not the dominant thing that repels people from us, mm -hmm. uh, Cecily. Not wanting to feel so, uncomfortable, painful emotions. Yes, a lack of humility to pain. Yeah. Mel, not wanting truth. Not wanting truth. Yes. What's the response to truth? Fear. Yes. <laughs> Go away. Even more than fear. Yeah. Anger. 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 Rejection. Anger. You know. Yeah. yeah. All of you know you can't really be in our company, especially Jesus. Me, may perhaps in a growing <laughs> sense, you can't really be in our company for very long before there's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Can you? <laughs> Has any of you done that? <laughs> <laughs> Who met us and went, oh, this is like easy going yeah. around these guys. <laughs> it starts before you even arrive. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where you guys, you all display a huge amount of humility. I often look around and go, wow. These guys, yeah, we're always talking to you about humility and we're showing you where you're not humble. But even in that, <laughs> even that you'll look at that, that displays humility, you know. Most people just get in a rage. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I find really great about Fred is 
he doesn't let the contrast between his condition and the condition of the celestial guides that he's hanging out mm -hmm. with dissuade him. Yes. Like he doesn't mm -hmm. just get overwhelmed and feel yeah. bad about himself and run away. Yeah. yeah. Like, which is pretty amazing, mm -hmm. really, because it, mm -hmm. he'd be feeling, I guess, his error. Yeah. 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 That's a very good point. Yeah. And what? So in that, how how is he able to not run away? What? He's, con he's constantly open to uh, being corrected. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and they're like, and he's like, la la la, and the inquisitor, right. inquisitor might just say, no, no, it's actually because of this. Yeah. And he just keeps staying open. And I find that an amazing quality about him. Yeah. He's open to the discomfort, he's open to the yeah. uncertainty, he's open to just even realizing he's less than. He also didn't have a lot of investment, did he, as he passed, that he was like, the guy, <laughs> 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 he thought he was in a pretty poor condition. That's actually, he feels a lot of gratitude, doesn't he? Mm. Yeah. In fact, he was almost the opposite, Mary. I remember some of the readings are like, you know, I'm going to help these people on earth, even if it means I finish in hell. Mm. Yes. Mm. Like, like his own, his own wherever he finished up wasn't as important to him as it was to show love to these people. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's very powerful. I think a big thing is he's willing to ask questions and then modify his um, his beliefs. Uh, he's willing to listen to the answer as well as ask the questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> How many of us ask a question yeah, that's right. that we really want to make a statement yeah. and then we don't even hear what the answer is? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I do that. <laughs> really, through, I'm like, so. Jesus, is this what this is? And he then he tells me the long answer. Yeah, but is this what this is? <laughs> yeah. 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 I just love the way he's so laid back and he's so solid in his openness and trust of God because you know he's saying the next bit. Well, there's no time here, mm. and and then well we sauntered along. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> and then he says, and there's all the every person we meet has a different story to tell, and I had nothing to do but learn. <laughs> oh my God, that hit me! I've double underlined that Wonderful. sentence. I had nothing to do but <laughs> learn. <laughs> well, it, that could just be a motto for life, couldn't yeah. it? Yeah. It would stand you. Forget time. Forget standards. Forget you know. I've got nothing to do but learn. Yeah. That is humility. Exactly. Wow. And then oh, I don't know. Was the chapter before or one of, one of the chapters before? He sort of got a big download of info. You know. <laughs> and he just sort of said, Oh well, I'm just putting that aside at the moment. <laughs> 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 I know. Yeah. Off I go. Yeah. It's like. So many of us have been just, you know, like, no, tearing at him yeah. like a dog with a bone, you know. And meanwhile, the next opportunity is missed us by. Exactly. The one that might have demonstrated what we exactly. needed to understand the previous yeah. one. Yeah. And that is also a quality of humility. There is, honestly, we could just make a character study of Fred in mm. terms of what is humility yeah. you know, mm. at this point, you know, because he shows, he shows how to live humility. Mm. It, it's not just a set of words. If we examine his behaviour, we see it demonstrated. Mm. Mm. And if you think about that, that's very powerful, isn't it? You know, mm. it's a very powerful gift he's given. Not just the narrative, but just mm. the, who he is. So. That's why I feel that's why he's being, why being taught all these things. Mm. Of course, yeah. Mm. There's nothing is by accident in the spirit world. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So nice. <laughs> Catherine? A little bit before that that yeah. I found interesting. Uh, well, it was, I was beginning to grow accustomed to the great advantages I had inherited in this new life. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was, I don't know, it just appealed to me. Yeah. It's, it's very beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's being humble too. Isn't it? it is. It, it's it's like you were saying about being open to being loved, being open to good experience, not going off and berating ourselves. We're not good enough. And all. It, being humble is accepting the good things as well as the painful things. Yeah, or the things that bring us joy. And mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. He's a very. He's not very self-involved, Fred. Is he? Mm -hmm. yeah. He's not really even think all this learning. He's not thinking, oh, this is great. I'm learning a lot here. Yeah. He's thinking, 
this is great. I can help so many people with this. Can you tell me some more? So can you see that when you're really humble, the, the idea to go off and berate yourself isn't really there because you're already thinking about how you're going to use these beautiful gifts to give more gifts. And, yeah, there's another big lesson in that as well. Hey? Yeah. Dave? There's a spot there, I didn't know it was a typo, down the end of that paragraph. Um, every incident had its own particular interest and charm as it discovered the methods of God in dealing with the sons of men on earth and leading the blind away. Okay, does anyone have that in this book? I, I didn't mm -hmm. find it. Mm -hmm. It's at the top of page 133, the first paragraph, or last sentence in the first paragraph. Um, we watched one who's proved. Really? Every incident has its own peculiar interest. Yeah, as it discovered the methods of God in dealing with. As I discovered. Yeah, because oh, yeah. so otherwise it's the incident yeah. discovering. Yes. Well, yes. Yeah, I sort of saw it as the incident discovering or showing the. Yeah, I think that's how I read it too. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I suspect it is actually typo. As I discovered the methods of God. I mean, lots of times. Oh, I was wondering whether it's um whether this is just as exactly as Robert J. Lee's transcribed it and that's why it's being true to that or is the person who typed this book just so distracted and they're just doing <laughs> um, Yeah, I, I think it's not... Can I put a yeah. geeky answer on that? A geeky answer, yeah. I think it's been scanned with one of those right. optical yeah. reading yeah. things yeah. and sure. sometimes yeah. it interprets well. It's one of the originals, yeah. so you can't find it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I know that Joseph re-edited this um, when he found it was out of print, so I suspect mm. it is yeah. a scanning issue. Mm. It's not... Uh, Robert James Lees didn't desire for it to be mm. exactly as he did mm. yeah. Dave? Uh, and in that sentence, to, to me, it, it's like, it's interesting, you know, that, that he discovered the methods of God dealing with the sons of men on earth in leading the blind by a way they do not know. Yeah, or they know not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like we don't have to know everything. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> don't you think it's a big relief when you finally get that? Like, I don't actually have to figure out how I'm going to be in two years or what it's going to look like or what I'm going to have to do in front. I just have to keep doing the bit in front of me and then it'll all keep, I'll just keep growing. God's got me in a process. I don't actually have to control anything. That is a really confronting. Confronting, yes. Mm. Confronting. But it's also a bit of truth. Free. Yeah. Free. Very. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there was another hand. Yes, Susan. I was going to say, my very favourite part of this whole chapter is um, where he talks about the bottom of page 133. Three, yes. Yeah, about religion and. It's maybe my mm. favourite bit in the whole book. It's my absolute <laughs> favourite, favourite bit. It's just. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, love, love and all the disciples have one dominion, lovers of mankind, and he goes on. Um, no one of all the man-made religions holds a monopoly of this attribute, mm -hmm. but yeah. earnest and conscientious followers of it may be found in all. Its worship is service to humanity, its litany, noble deeds, its prayers, tears of sympathy, its sermons, simple lives. I just think it's just... Such a beautiful, beautiful yeah. um, paragraph there. So he, what, what is he describing? That question is describing something. What is that? The religion of love. The religion of love. And what's he saying about the religion of love? How did service? Oh, did it, this, this, this love it. Oh, oh this, they love what is Fred asking? Is there, is there one religion which is most right? Like yes. Yeah. Yeah. Who who gets saved the most out of all yeah. religions? Yeah. 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 And he has this beautiful answer that it's love. Yeah. It's actually love in the hearts of men and women. Mm -hmm. So how did you guys apply this to your lives? Yeah. <laughs> Seeing where I didn't. <laughs> yeah. And it's just back to the basics, you, you, you know, like um, what what... You know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. And that's sort of just very yeah. basic brotherly, sisterly love, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Teresa? I just got stuck on one word of this. Yes. It's about the immolation of self, which I looked up yes. to be sacrifice. And I've got this thing about 
not having, you know, if we're sacrificing ourselves, we're not being loving. So I'm mm. just wondering about the um, uh -huh. definition of that. Okay. Yep. Any anyone else? Yeah, I looked Challenge. it up and self-immolation is the practice of setting oneself on fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to talk to you guys about Afterwards. this in a couple of ways. Just a couple um, of symptoms of oh, okay. immolation. Firstly, why do you have such a strong uh, feeling about it, do you think? Um. Just that I, well, I've always put myself last, and now I'm trying to make at least on the same level as everybody else. So I see this as counter to that. Yeah. Do you know the? But what's the feeling you have when you talk about? It? I have an anger. Anger. Yeah. yeah. So when you're angry, are you really putting yourself at the same level as everyone else? I'm putting them above above others. I, yeah. I deserve better. I deserve. I'm demanding more. Well, what's creating your anger? Um, well, addiction, not being met. Yes. Do you know what the addiction is? The world needs to look after me. That's, yes. Yeah. So, have you really been sacrificing yourself? No, but that's what it's telling me to do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> which is triggering your addiction. Yeah. Which is. That the world needs to look the after world needs to look after me no I don't want to sacrifice anything I want the world to look after me so are, in that place are you putting yourself at the same are you desiring to love yourself equally with other people no okay cool all right this is important because the emotional responses you have to these words are, are very they tell you a lot yeah. they tell you a lot yeah. yeah and a lot of people have this this huge anger about the, this issue of sacrifice and they tell me a story that it's because I've been sacrificing and I've always put myself last when really the feeling I have is no you're actually really angry about the thought of you know not not having a place at the table not being the one who's going to be looked after which is actually very different to being comfortable with sacrificing yourself it's saying no I'm not sacrificing myself and I'm demanding that you don't sacrifice me either so can you see that firstly Okay. Yvonne, did you have your hand up? I did some time ago, but I can't try okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. The second thing, why do you think it uses this word? What do you think? We talked about it last week actually in Queensland, but you guys haven't seen that. What do you because we talked there was the word self-sacrifice last week. Why what would he be trying to impart through sacrifice? Um, I'm not sure, but when I first saw that word, immediately was just like, oh, yeah, like the definition I mean, yeah. sacrifice. Because for me, um, if I'm always wanting to take or wanting approval, it's all about me and what I can get. Whereas when I um, release those injuries, it will be about sharing, it will be about giving, it will be about loving others. Yes. And not getting my little addictions and needs met. So you're actually sacrificing, what are you sacrificing? My my need for my addiction your self myself selfishness mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. your selfishness mm -hmm. and you're submitting <coughs> to something service. more like service mm -hmm. yeah can everyone see that there's there's they use the terminal a lot of christian terminology in this mm -hmm. uh, book and that's because of fred where is that at that time mm -hmm. <laughs> um but also robert james lee is being a christian yeah so there's there's this thing that happens where we we hear the word sacrifice but if you can see it as a, a, um service they're really talking about having pure service and for for most people if you think about it that does require sacrificing a lot of your selfish desires which you would do anyway if you grew in love do you see that yeah alexis yeah. I'm having this effect on people where I just say two sentences and then yeah, I I love I love this that it's um that the the dominant denomination is lovers of mankind yes. and its worship is service to humanity. In other words, there's no formal worship. It's only the acts mm. in service to humanity that count. Yes. Yeah. Yep. 
Yes, this one. Mary, I feel that um, like my desire to be of service becomes greater as I feel my grief about, you know, what I didn't get, that I wasn't loved, that all of this, that then I'm more able and I'm able and I have a desire to give. It just naturally comes out of me. Yes, yeah. And sometimes I feel I need to be patient with myself at times when I feel like I can't give now. I, I just can't go and this or that. I'm, I'm just so involved with my grief or, or whatever it is I'm feeling. But then if I allow that, then suddenly there's a lot more that can come out of me to give. Yes. So, given that Kushna is explaining to him that love is the true religion on the planet. Love is the thing that defines your freedom in the spirit world. Love is the quantity that really means you have a relationship with God, this development in love. So why do you think Jesus and I talk a lot about emotion? Because it's the block mm. to love. Which is really what you're describing, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And like, if Teresa feels her grief, then she won't feel angry. She'll want it, like, not just you, Teresa, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. just using her example. Yeah. I relate to the, the thing, The thing where, honestly, I see a lot of people who listen to us get stuck is that they stay angry. They say, I can't give right now. I've got to have my own pain. And, or I just need to feel my grief. I can't give right now. When really, they're still angry. And there's a resistance to move beyond that point. And that is missing the point, I feel. Laura. And also when people have a desire to feel their emotion, I believe that that's, I mean, it's a nice desire, but there's people that can also um, desire to, to feel their emotion, which gets them in a downward spiral. It's almost like there's no anchor towards a loving desire to move through, and the emotions are just going to happen as we are humble to move towards something. Yeah. Yes. And this is why if your only desire to have a relationship with God is to end your pain, you can, and then you go, okay, I've just got to feel emotion, then my pain will be gone. And you are not anchored or with the compass of, I desire to grow in love. I desire to, there must be some noble desire within you or you will get lost. Mm -hmm. And it will end up serving your addictions. Mm -hmm. it, it, it will. So there has to be some some other and this is where this magic thing of love having having a, an ideal or a moral compass in your life is going to keep drawing you along and not get you bogged down in emotion and when i see people going oh like i'm not discounting what you said actually says because there is there are times when you are overwhelmed but but listen carefully when you are overwhelmed by grief and you are focusing on that mm. and that is very valid mm. but if you are sitting at home not overwhelmed by grief <laughs> going i can't serve yet i can't give yet because i've really got to deal with myself and that you are angry <laughs> and you are desiring to stay angry because you're not out there dealing with it you are just telling yourself a story that is helping you maintain an unloving state mm. and and very often like if you have a resistance to giving there's one of two things happening. You're angry, which means an addiction of yours is not being met. Or you can feel there's an addiction in the other person mm -hmm. demanding that you give to them and you might feel resistive to it. Do you see the two things? One, mm -hmm. so, but otherwise, <laughs> I don't know, because it's hard for me because I, I, whenever I don't want to give, I know I'm angry. <laughs> that, that's just the, the way it is. And, and I feel like people want to give themselves excuses not to serve and not to grow in love. And um, I feel really passionate about people, like we, the only reason we talk about healing your emotional damage is so that you can embrace the one true religion. Mm -hmm. Our hearts are set on this, on love. Mm -hmm. This is why we are here talking to you. We, we desire this for ourselves and we desire to show you the beauty of it. And when, when I see people hearing part of it, going, I've got to be humble, I've got to feel my emotions, but actually I'm going to be angry about being a victim for the next three years. I think, that's, that's fine, that's your own free will, but that's not what I meant. <laughs> you know, I didn't mean that. And um, what I meant was, if you really want to love, then the most powerful way you're going to be able to do it is to 
to accept yourself, you know, not just try to avoid your pain, but really accept yourself. And then even while you're in pain, you can give. Mm -hmm. <laughs> even while you're just acknowledging your own pain, you are more connected with other people around you. It's when we're resisting our pain that we resist connection with other people and we resist giving. Mm -hmm. And that's a valid place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay to be in that place, mm -hmm. but recognize the place. Don't tell yourself a story about how oh, I'm dealing with things and that's why I'm not acting. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with things, you will start acting. Mm -hmm. Before then, you're resisting and you're probably angry. So let yourself be real about that and feel why you're angry. Really get into the anger and don't brew in it. Let it come out of you, you know. Write about it in your journal. Scream it out at the, you know, the logs that you're chopping your firewood or, or whatever it is. Let it come out, you know. For me, that's the only way I've dealt sincerely with anger. Like you probably know, I've had a lot of anger. Yeah. And I've judged it and I've tried to not have it. And it's caused me to do a heap of things that I then have felt shame about all these other things, you know. The only time I've made progress is to get really real with myself. I've wanted to say I'm really spiritual, I've wanted to say that I know I do have a loving desire, I really want the, but I didn't want to say I'm just angry because I'm hurting and I don't want to be hurt. And it's only since I've really been to that place and felt it that I feel any different. Matt? I find I get this feeling come up of like, it's not fair that I should have to give when no one's given to me. And what's that? Anger. Yeah. 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 But I find then I do give and then it's a really beautiful thing. Yeah. But I guess I probably just need to feel through that. Well, I would feel through it, hey, because there is an addiction that says people have to give to me. Nobody actually has to give to you. Mm -hmm. It's always giving is a gift, you know. It's not a right, it's not something I can demand. Um, even God, even God doesn't have to love me. He's giving me that gift. But I would deal with the anger, man, because that is going to help you actually give abundantly and give without reservation. You'll give in a loving way, so you won't give to, at the expense of yourself, which is why we have this resistance to the word sacrifice. I understand that, because it's often associated with denial of self. What I'm saying is we're going to have to sacrifice some addictive parts of ourselves if we want to love. And then we'll naturally fall into service, I feel. Mm -hmm. That's just speaking from me. That's just what it feels like for me as I go through that. I'm beginning <coughs> to feel that, like in the sense of, um, I tried and I try, I still try. <laughs> and it doesn't work. It does not work. And it's like, um, what I'm noticing is, you know, my life's not, I mean, it's changed since for yeah, the last years, but it's like when I just don't um, try and I don't force and I don't whatever, it's like changes just automatically do happen, and and I'm really surprised by that because yeah. I don't still trust that. Yeah. But it, and, and and also you don't like Peter always goes, you don't have to go anywhere to find it, Eloisa. You know, like it will just come there if if you you know if you're allowed. Yeah. And I think there's a real. Um, yeah, real power in that. Yeah. So just allowing what's already in you to come out. Yeah. 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 And, and not even just, yeah, you like, know, just not, uh, like, still judge and still self punish, but just less. And it's like nothing happens for weeks at a time. Like, that's how it feels. But at least I'm not just in this, like, I know I've got anger, but I'm not always angry. And I can actually go and play with the kids and enjoy them yeah. rather than just being like, yeah, I haven't done it today. And, and I don't know, there's a freedom in that, I suppose, maybe. Yeah. There's a lot of joy, I found, that just naturally comes to your life when you give up the addiction of self-punishment. Yeah. No, yeah. It, it's massive. Yeah. It's like a weight was lifted and I was like, what happened? I don't feel happy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot. I, really, I had this moment when we were overseas a couple of months ago where I was just going for a walk and I thought, I feel happy <laughs> and it brought me to tears because I thought I can't remember when I felt this 
Like I must have been really little <laughs> when I felt this good and when I didn't feel so guilty about myself. Like, so that's why I always talk to people about self-punishment because it's debilitating. And it's really hard to have God in connection with you when you're adamantly saying, I'm bad, God, I'm bad. And he's like, oh, I would like to tell you something different, but you won't let go of this thing. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I find quite difficult is to um, separate the way that God sees me through through her eyes and the way that um, my mother saw me through her eyes. And I have to, while I'm grieving, I, as soon as I start to say mama yeah. to God, it's the, the, the disgust, the shame, the critical, like, and I have to pray to really, like, God, Marisa, like, I have to say her name to separate mama from mama. Yeah. And there's a lot of grief that I can't, there's, they're, they're quite overmeshed. And that's, and that's yeah. also why we talk to you guys so much about injuries that you have with your parents because it's normal that that would happen more. While, you, while there's still grief in each of us about our mum, our perception of our mother God will be clouded by that. So I feel it's just allowing yourself, like pray more about your mum, you know. Pray more about not denying her as your mum because that's how she is inside of you still and really just desiring to connect to that because it, it will open you up to God yeah. but it's good that like a lot of us just punish ourselves rather than feel that our parents punished us mm -hmm. if you can feel even that oh my mum did punish me I don't have to do it I just have to feel the pain that mum did it that that's a step along the way yeah. Yeah. and it's awesome that it, it feels visceral like that the enmeshment of, of you, my perception of the it, yeah. I sense the yeah. two and I have to sometimes physically just start to go like that to connect more like put to, and you know, I suppose what I'm saying to you like I, I hear what you're saying I, I suppose what I'm saying to you is rather than trying to push them apart connect more to your earth mum and the pain and then it'll naturally and then it'll happen. naturally happen yeah yeah Alexis um why do you feel we we keep going back to the earth parents when it's beyond a shadow of a doubt shown that they are you know at least for now incapable of loving and then there's at least a god that seems to be loving yeah. like it just seems absurd actually that we keep going back to something that we clearly have, have felt doesn't work why do you think we do that a <laughs> 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 God connection and often when we're little our parents are all that we know so ingrained on us from a very young age is these false beliefs and errors that this is the religion this is the God yes. and it's a matter well for me over the last three years of being you know trying to be on the way it's correcting those false beliefs and it's yeah. grieving into the losses of how poor parenting I had and yeah. and um, so I feel it's it's a lack of a, an awareness of a God connection. And a, a perception when we're very small that these people are, everything they told us about love we took on, yeah. it, they were powerful, they were like God, they controlled everything that happened in our life, yeah. All, but also their perceptions of God. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm struggling with this because you know, like if, if you were hanging out, say, with a business partner or something, and then he bullshitted you enough, you, you know, you wouldn't go back and be like, hey, let's start a new business. You know, like, so <laughs> it's, not <laughs> it's not logical. I'm fine. I agree. It's not logical. <laughs> when we have a parent who is infinitely loving, to yeah. keep trying to seek love, which is what most of us are doing, seek love from people who have shown they've got injuries in love right now and they can't love as perfectly yeah. as God. It's very illogical. But that's the thing about unfelt emotion. It makes us illogical. Mm -hmm. But, Alexis, you actually answered your own question when we were talking before the group. You, you said to me, what did you say to me about this feeling about opening up to God? How does it feel? Uh, extremely vulnerable. Vulnerable. Yeah. So it feels unsafe. It feels like, oh my gosh. Right. Can I trust you, God? Mm -hmm. And where does that feeling come from? in your childhood you know by people who had authority over you and so now when you when you consider a person who has like authority over the universe you go wow are you really gonna love me because this is a big deal here like, yeah it's so hard to trust 
Yeah, and I, like, as I said to you before, I feel like that's something that all of us face. If we sincerely want to open our hearts to God, we face that. We face, it's going to feel, it's not actually an actual fact vulnerable, but we will feel vulnerable because we've never been shown that amount of trustworthy love. But I feel it's good that you feel that. <laughs> you're at least feeling that part because that's showing that you're considering it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I just, well, I, I feel that. that you, feel, you feel a bit angry today about it all, which I understand. Yeah, but also I feel like I just have to go a new way too. Yeah. Like, because the old ways just don't work. Yeah. yeah. So you feel you have to take a risk. Yeah. Which is awesome. Yeah. Okay. Hands. Yep. Yeah. Dave. Just talking about anger in general, I'm starting to get a sense that you know, I generally don't get angry out there much, but with self-judgment and whatnot, it's anger being turned in, which is probably just as damaging and feeding other addictions in different ways. Uh, yes, it's, it is. It is very damaging. Mm -hmm. Anger with other people is damaging to us and damaging to them. Anger with ourselves is still very damaging. It's really damaging, it's not. And, and for you, Dave, there's a lot of addiction that you, you do manage to get met by not being angry, by being soft and sort of, just sort of, um, kind of, it's actually a little bit manipulative, what well, most addiction is, <laughs> um, where you, you think, I can give this bid and then they'll give me that bid and you, you manage it. And so a lot, so a lot of times, addiction isn't confronted that much. Often around myself or AJ it gets confronted a bit, doesn't it? And then you get angry with yourself, which is just, which is just the alternative of getting angry with us. It's still avoiding what's actually underneath, which is a fear. And it feels, you know, for yourself, it, there's a feeling of vulnerability in you that you keep avoiding through trying, this needy addiction is actually avoiding this feeling like I'm not going to be loved, I feel unsafe, I feel vulnerable, you know? Yeah. But I agree, it is very damaging when we become angry with ourselves. That's what I was meaning about the self-punishment. Mm -hmm. It's just, oh, it's heavy. It doesn't get us into anything, it doesn't, you know, waste of time. it's a waste of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Teresa. Well, I feel about it is that it actually helps us avoid everything completely. That's why we do it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't have to feel hurt. <coughs> we we mm -hmm. self punish in order to avoid the real emotional process that's happening. Yeah. Laura. I guess I, what I'm also learning about myself is when I, I was little, I had a lot of dreams and aspirations of wanting my parents one day to look at me with eyes of admiration or honour or respect or something. Yeah. And I only know now as an adult that it was an addiction all along, but the grieving of that lost dream that that's never going to happen feels like a crushed childhood dream. Yeah. It doesn't just feel like I'm letting go of an addiction intellectually, it really feels like I'm really never ever going to have those loving eyes look upon me. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 And it, it is that real. It's, it becomes an addiction when in your adult life you try to seek it out with other people, you know? As a child, it feels painful. You, you want to. You, you want to be loved, you want to be seen. Um, and that you, you can't really punish yourself for that. That's, you came out like wide open like Fred, <laughs> you know? What's my experience? And also what happens with us, with our parents, we constantly look to them to define us, you know? And, and when, when they ignore us or when they don't pay attention to us, we're like, oh, who am I? I'm nothing. Okay. Yeah, am I okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only, oh, sorry Mary, the only way that we can give up addiction of self-punishment is by grieving the way that our parents um, regarded us. For me, Catherine, I'll speak for me, it was, it involved less grief, it involved some grief, but I'm not fully I'm not fully through the grief of how my parents treated me. But there, I, I decided to allow truth, some truth, to enter me. So I grieved some to let that truth enter me. And that was that my self-punishment was an addiction and that I didn't, I didn't deserve to be punishing myself all the time. 
and that I didn't deserve to be harshly treated by, by my parents. That helped me identify the truth that, that I had, see before, before I was telling myself bad messages about myself. I'm bad, I'm terrible, I'm an idiot, what do I do that for? Oh my gosh, you know, all that. I was like turning it in on myself all of the time. The same as your parents told you, you were telling yourself. Yes. The, the thing that changed was I was willing to be open to the truth. One, that this wasn't helping me and God didn't, God didn't feel like that about me. So why was I doing it to myself? But the second was to consider emotionally that other people, that other people did that to me, gave me those messages, and it felt more painful to feel that other people had done it than to do it to myself. So I had to be willing to give up doing it to myself by accepting the truth, that this, is, this isn't serving me, this isn't actually the truth about me. And then, by, and then recognizing, ah, there was other things that happened that made me want to do this to myself. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Does that make sense? Sorry, would you just repeat that last bit, Mary? So I had to accept the truth that this wasn't loving to myself mm -hmm. and that actually I was doing this in preference of feeling yeah. that these things had been told to me or messages by my environment, not always by just my parents but by other experiences, had had given me these messages and I didn't want to feel the pain of that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Karina? Um, I'd like to go back to the service thing with um, Fred and the giving thing. Yeah. And I'm in the process of, of, of learning about service and I'm sort of like schizophrenic. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, well, because I started voluntary work when I was 11. I spent a whole life enjoying what I thought was service. In the last couple of years, I've done nothing because all I could see was addictions in that. Which has been good for you, yeah. So now I'm like feeling this desire to give, but every time I get an impetus to do something, I suddenly see all the pitfalls and all the addictions and all, you know, and so I just like, just stay safe and <laughs> don't do anything. So I don't know if there's any, any advice. <laughs> Well, I think it just requires humility, Karina. It requires the humility to not live in addiction around it, but also the humility to take action and receive the feedback. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to, to have an open heart to receive the feedback. So to be sensitive to what's happening. Trust me, when you do things in addiction with an open heart, like when you desire to break the addiction, maybe that's a better way of saying it, when you actually have developed a desire not to be in addiction anymore, when you slip into it, you go, oh, that feels gross, <laughs> yes. you know? Yes. Oh, I feel like, oh, what did I do? I just slimed myself by doing that, you know? I, I kind of bartered myself in order to get an emotion from someone, you know? I, I, you feel the de degrade degradation of your own soul, actually. You go, oh, that's yuck, you know? So if you, have, if you feel you've <clears throat> developed the desire to do it in a pure way, you can take action and feel, like let the feedback come to you. And when it does and you go, oh, that fell off, pray, okay, I want to connect with where there is. What am I avoiding in order to, to barter myself in that way? How can I heal that God? I want, to, I want to serve in a pure way. And in my experience of, say, doing this book group, <laughs> that happens tangibly for me, you know? Because I feel I do have a desire to honour to honour Robert and Fred's beautiful gift and to not teach error, either through my words or my actions, I go, I'm not perfect. So I go, I go home from a book group and I go, okay, <laughs> I need to feel about what was off there, you know? And because it's, there's 22 chapters, I'm gonna have, <laughs> I can't just go, oh, I give up. <laughs> I'm going back the next week and because there's that desire there, I feel it does lead me towards growth. And perhaps, you know, I feel I'm still strengthening my desire also. The more I strengthen my desire, the more humble I'll become each time. 
but certainly some desire has led me to grow some amount, I feel, because I stay involved in the action and I'm just humble to the feedback. And sometimes the feedback comes not just from me, I've got Jesus telling me, or I have an interaction with someone and I think, oh, actually, oh, there's something there for me, I need to feel about that, you know? Yeah. So, hmm. Alexis? Well, may I share something with you that I felt that you just said recently that felt off just about yeah. five minutes ago? Yes. Um, you were saying we rely on our parents to define us. Yes. And I feel my experience is that God doesn't sit there and try and define us. He encourages us to define ourselves. Yes, but um, can you not see that as a child yeah. you looked out you didn't have a sense of self yet. Yeah, that's, so you yeah, looked out right. and the messages you received back often yeah. caused you to define yourself. Yeah, and, and, and in that, like what, what my experience is with so many people is that our parents ended up just sitting there like, well, you are this, you are this, which wasn't our nature. And so no. we became something we weren't even supposed to become. And that was exactly my point. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. Obviously, when we enter a relationship with God as our parent, yeah. God's not... Well, no, actually, it is true. If you ask God, show me who I am, yeah. you're going to learn more about who you are than if you say, I'm this. Yeah. You know? It's different than parents saying, let me tell you who you are, who you should be. Yeah. yeah. And that's what happened. They did define a lot of our self-concept. Did they not? Yeah, are we? Yeah. 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 So that's, that's what I'm saying. We, we looked out and we said, world, you are defining me. Yeah, exactly. Because we didn't have... We, remember, this whole experience of incarnation mm -hmm. is about developing self-awareness, mm -hmm. a knowledge of ourselves, and that being able to use that self in a relationship with God mm -hmm. is the next step. But the first step is like, I exist. I'm an entity, <laughs> you know? And when we're born, we don't have that sense. And so whatever... This is why we talk about this so much. Whatever messages are given to us, we go, yup, okay, that must be right. right. We wouldn't have any other source of information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's so powerful if, if you can teach your kids about God, <laughs> you know, and if you can have a relationship with God yourself, and if you can pray for divine love for your child while they're in your womb. And, you know, there's lots of ways where you can begin to shift that, even before you're perfect yourself. Yeah. But... Um, Largely, they have defined what we feel about ourselves. So, ideally, if our parents were feeling us more, they would be able to encourage our true nature yes. instead of what they thought we should become like. But what would that require on their part? Oh, yeah. <coughs> oh well, just feel, feel us for starters. Yeah. So how are they going to feel themselves? How are they going to feel? Themselves, feel yeah. They have to feel themselves before sure, they can sure, feel sure, you. Sure. Yeah. Matt? I suppose as well, they can ask God as well about their own child. And What's the nature of my child and how can I best assist that child? They can't, but how are they going to receive feedback from God? Humble. They have to want to feel themselves. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I have to want to, yeah. Yeah, which is humility. Yeah. 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 Teresa, we probably need to finish. Is it three? Yeah. Um, is that all this? It was something you just said yep. um, about the child, praying for the child to get divine love. Yeah. And I've um, wondered about the free will of the child and that and that it feels like when, when we, if, if I'm pregnant and I pray for God to give my child love the child hasn't asked for that so I'm wondering with the child has a very undeveloped will at that point don't they they don't even know they have a will before they incarnate yeah. so I feel they are open to that reception unless there's a feeling in the mother or the father that I don't want love, you know? But you're not, I don't feel that they can, God wouldn't allow them to receive love against their will, it's impossible. Yeah. So that, their little will has to be open to the reception of it. Yeah. But I can pray for you to receive divine love. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's not going, you're not going to receive it unless you're also open to it. Yeah. But it's a loving desire of mine, isn't it? To desire that you would receive love, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe that every loving desire that we have directed towards God has an effect. So, in, in that, does that answer your question? Um, I'm just thinking about how, how some people, I think this comes back to the gates of heaven and the closing business and, and the stuff about people who haven't received any divine love 
won't progress. I don't know how true that is, but it, it comes back to the, these, these children may for the rest of their life decide, no, I didn't want, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there, but they're sort of forced to because they've already received some love. And that's... Ah, I see. Yeah. yeah, I don't feel that that is possible. Like, there has to be the conditions within the parents that would make the child open to God's love. I feel inherently we are created open to God. Before incarnation, I believe we are open to God. It's only through the injuries of the earth existence where there's been a decision to walk away from God that we close to God. Now, it doesn't mean we exercise our will and our desire in, towards God. Do you see the difference? It's unlikely if I'm open that I won't, yeah. but it is different. Yeah. If I'm open to God, I can still choose just as a modern man did, I don't want God, mm. and walk away. Okay. Yeah, not quite. <laughs> not quite? Yeah. 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 I feel that there's, there's a feeling in you I about your choice. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I feel that when you release that feeling, it won't, it won't be an issue so much. Yeah. God, God is never going to give you will and override it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So God is never going to create a condition where you are going to be, um, without the use of your will, you'll either be in the celestial heavens or out of it, you know. But the, the, the child in the womb does have a will, doesn't it? It's a given one. Yeah, it just. Has it's undeveloped, yeah. it, but it's there. Yeah. And so I feel that there has to be within the parents an openness to God and then that child is free to begin the expression of that will. Do you understand? Not quite, but I'll just no. yeah. Let's talk about it again next week. Yeah. yeah. So have, just sit with it for a while. Yep, Matt? Um, because the, the child is so open, can I just tell you for a second? Yes. I think we're over time, so if okay. you need to leave, I'm not offended. Okay, go. Um, that, of course, the child would be, like, if love's being projected towards it, like, why wouldn't it receive it? Mm -hmm. Like, well, you'd you, you, you have to have an area inside of your soul to go, oh, <laughs> that's, that's overwhelming. <laughs> I don't want that. Yeah. 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 The child, remember, is humble to its experience. This is how it receives all these messages. So if it receives love from God, it would be humble to that. Yeah. It says. Um, I feel there's a quote in here that um, sort of refers to that. Um, I sort of had a feeling that when I receive love, it's like, you know, from Jesus and, and then from you too, the power of that, because I'd never experienced that before, but it, um, but I feel that I have some memory of it. it. It's like this this feeling that I already know that that's what I'm really going towards. Like it touches something. And then here, where he talks about um, the old visionary in a name heaven had passed away, and in its place had just um, been discovered a rest which would be an employment. Mm -hmm. A worship which would be, which was an unfoldment. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to the very end of that line. Yes, that's of that. right. um, an apotheosis only to be reached by the expansion of the divinity, which, although unknown, had always lain buried within myself. Mm -hmm. So I feel that, as you're saying, God has created us in the beginning really pure, and and even though God we, has created a space inside of us, not yet filled, for God. Yes. Yeah. And that's almost what I feel, well, there's some innate knowing or something or some certainly recognition. Um, it's a bit hard to just... It's to hard it, because um, everyone, it, it, everyone is actually coming also from... We are so affected by this incarnation process. Some people feel dead to that memory that you feel you have. Do you know what I mean? Some people feel like it is not there because their parents were shut down mm -hmm. or the environment was shut down there was you know so some people don't have that feeling. i see so if your parents had an openness to god which is what you were just saying then of course you're going to have more chance of feeling that 
Yes, and feeling God. Yeah. Which is logical, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's something I can be so incredibly grateful to my parents in spite of all the... Yes. Well, I mean, of course, there's, there's wonderful stuff too, but that's yeah. the most wonderful, actually. Absolutely. Matt? Um, uh, my, um, my daughter recently... Um, uh, this was passed on to me by my um, by my previous partner. Um, was sitting there at the bus stop and then started talking to God, and then asked for some of God's love, and then like um, just sat there, um, and then afterwards was saying that she feels more space inside of her, mm -hmm. but she didn't cry. Mm -hmm. And like I guess just from a purely logical perspective, I'm wondering like. Do you cry every single time you receive divine love, even if you're a child? Well, why do we usually cry when we receive divine love? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually it's triggering a lot of grief, there's error yeah. being confronted, all those kinds of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so it's possible. But I would also think, Matt, back to when you conceived your daughter and the belief systems you had about God then and the spiritual, the spirit interactions you had. And I feel when you told that story, I had more of a feeling about that, that she's communicating with the spirit who's telling her she's God, yeah, He's, that they're God. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was feeling. Yeah. Anyway, we need to wrap up, guys. Um, you all nicely avoided my question. <laughs> what, does, what does this passage about the true religion, how does it relate to your life? <laughs> this is your homework uh, if you choose to accept it. Um, to consider how this relates to your life, what it means in relation to the truth that you have heard, and also um, how you feel it would fare, how you feel it would fare when you enter the spirit world right now. Um, and <laughs> And how many excuses you're making for yourself to avoid an untrue religion. Mm. Just because you hear it, doesn't mean you know it or live it, does it? Yeah. Okay, thanks guys. We're here again. Uh, I wanted to ask you about timing. What time suits everyone for the book group? Is this time a good time? Yeah. I usually put it at one. Yeah. Okay, good. If it's good for you guys, let's do it at one. Awesome. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Thanks, Mary.